The first story I'd like to tell you uh, is from John James Audubon. And since many of you know me as Audubon, I will put on the hat and the accent. Um, this is a story that Audubon wrote um, early in his life and part of what really hooked him into birding and it was the spring migration. When Audubon was young, we didn't fully understand migration. And there was still this idea that uh, you may have heard versions of, I still see it popping up on social media, that hummingbirds will nestle in a goose's feathers to migrate. It's a myth, but it still amazes me how that pops up. Other people believe that birds would actually hibernate. Now we do know that hummingbirds go into a torpor in the evening and their heartbeat goes literally from a thousand beats per minute to less than 60 beats per minute, less than one beat per second, but they don't hibernate to migrate. Um, Pliny and the early Greeks wrote about birds hibernating and we didn't understand migration even in Audubon's day. But when Audubon settled along Perkyoman Creek in New Jersey, um, just outside of Philadelphia, just across the river from Philadelphia, um, Audubon had this lovely little bird nesting on his, uh, on his father's property. And I'm gonna move this in a little closer so you can see the peewee flycatcher. It's one of my favorite of Audubon's portraits in large part because of this story. My papa had uh, purchased a farm along Perkyoman Creek from a friend of George Washington, but that is another story for another day. And in the cave where we were mining for galena for lead, there were peewee flycatchers that were nesting there. And they had this idea that birds would sometimes hibernate and I knew it was not true. I knew that birds would migrate. And so I captured some and I tied a silver thread about their ankle. I knew that cloth, cotton or wool might deteriorate and other metal might rust, but silver will not. I caught several of them and affixed them with a small silver bracelet. I turned them loose in the autumn and I saw them fly south. And the very same birds returned the following spring. How do I know they were the same birds? How many have you seen wearing a little silver bracelet? Which not only makes me the first man in America to ban a bird and to prove that they migrate, but also this uh, new idea that some speak of called uh, uh, site fidelity, that the same birds return to the same nesting sites in the spring. And so the hummingbirds or the rose-breasted grosbeak or the, uh, the osprey or the yellow-rumped warblers that you saw flying off in the fall, it will be the very same birds that return to those nests in the following spring. So a very short piece of my performance is Audubon, uh, taken from Audubon's journals. But it is amazing that Audubon was not only the first man to band a bird in North America and to prove that they migrate, but he wrote about an idea that uh, ornithologists have only recently been able to confirm and, and become part of the vernacular, and that is sight fidelity. If you read Audubon's journals, and I highly recommend, and that is actually uh, just out of reach. I had one close. Um, it, and I highly recommend you read Audubon's journals. Um, he was a brilliant ornithologist. People love to talk about, I call his seven famous mistakes, um, but they ignore the fact that he wrote several thousand pages published in seven volumes, five to 10 pages, about 465 species. You do the math, five to 10 pages, about 465 species. He called the ornithological biography and it is the biography of every bird. And so pick your favorite bird. Some of you have already listed them. And I will challenge you, if you go to the National Audubon website, uh, click on the Birds of America Audubon, you can read what Audubon wrote about your favorite bird. And I promise you, you will learn something new. And yes, you need to sift because he did make a few famous mistakes. But, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time, uh, he was right on the money with lots of ideas lots of good scientific evidence and observation that we're only recently beginning to confirm, like the idea of site fidelity. And so Audubon has been my gateway to birds. And I will challenge you, um, and let me just see a quick show of hands, uh, if you wanna hit the reactions. How many of you have read some of Audubon's essays? Um, if you click on the reactions, or if I, you have your video on, I see a couple of hands there. 
Uh, so click on the reactions and either a thumbs up or uh, a raised hand if you have read some of Audubon's essays. I highly recommend that you start with your favorite bird. And again, I promise you, you'll learn something new. He worked with a, a Scottish ornithologist, um, Bewick. Maybe you heard of Bewick's Wren. Uh, Audubon named Bewick's Wren for his friend Bewick. Um, and Bewick uh, was also an engraver working with woodcut rather than the copper lithography that, uh, that Audubon did. Um, so Audubon was my gateway. And um, I've been a lifelong birder. I actually began birding young, but I've been portraying Audubon for more than 20 years now. And I used to joke, I'm not a real ornithologist. I just play one on stage. <laughs> um, but because I've been doing this full time for 20 years and I get to go to all these scientific conferences and meet all these field uh, ornithologists, um, I always try to spend time in the field with them. Uh, my one disappointment in Mississippi last week at the Mississippi Turn Festival, I flew down a couple of days early because I was supposed to help uh, to mark some nest along the beach. But because of recent storms and rain, um, they have not started nesting yet on the uh, Mississippi Gulf Coast. It's probably happening this week, right after I left. Um, but the really cool thing is I talked to the ornithologist who's published several papers on terns. And one of the really amazing things is they are beach nesters and they don't build a nest like a lot of birds. They just make a little scrape, a little indentation where they lay their eggs. But because of all the development along the coast, um, a lot of their nesting habitat has been destroyed but they are very adaptable. So as they take and, and uh, build dredge islands when they clear the, the rivers for shipping, those dredge islands actually become prime nesting sites for least terns. And my favorite is there's a shopping mall on the Pascagoula River. And because of the large flat gravel roof, there's a major tern nesting colony with more than 50 nesting pairs on top of the roof of that shopping mall which turns out to be a real boon for the birds because they don't have to worry about the same kind of predators or uh, recreational beachgoers damaging their nest on the roof of the uh, shopping mall. And because I really value the expert opinions and the eyewitness accounts of historical naturalists, I've also made it a priority to try to interview as many scientists as I can, to spend time in the field with them, and especially our elders, so one more comment in the chat. Um, who are some of the elder birders that were a hero to you, who kind of gave you a leg up, who uh, has given you a hand, who's encouraged or nurtured you? Um, one of my favorite, of course, is Frank Belrose. Um, and a, a quick uh, thumbs up if you know Frank Belrose, um, or if you had the honor to meet him before he left us I think about 10 years ago. Um, but if you don't know Frank, I highly recommend, he wrote the Bible on ducks, geese, and swans of North America. Um, he spent 50 years following bird migration. And so going through time, starting with John James Audubon is one of the first to prove that birds migrate. Frank Belrose was the first to prove that birds migrate using the stars. And I'll never forget him telling me this story. So his specialty is ducks, geese, and swans and waterfowl. And so he went out and he caught some mallards in a net. And then uh, this is long before radio telemetry or any of the modern satellites or the ways we track birds in these days. He actually taped a little tiny battery and a light bulb with masking tape, a paper tape, so it would deteriorate and fall off. Um, and uh, and before there were flashlights, before a handheld flashlight was even invented, he was inventing something like that with a tiny battery and a tiny light bulb taped to the leg of a mallard. He would throw the mallard up into the air on a clear starry night, and you could see the light circle two or three times, get its bearing, and then zoom, off it went to the north. He did the same thing on a cloudy night. And when he threw the mallard up on a cloudy night, it would circle a couple of times. It couldn't get its bearings. It didn't have the stars to guide it. And it would land often because the cloud meant a storm was coming and they didn't want to travel in that storm. And so he was able to prove 
uh, that birds use the stars to migrate because they are they do tend to fly on clear nights to ride the front of a storm before the clouds move in. He did say that a German ornithologist beat him to the punch on publication uh, because Frank was a very meticulous scientist and he wanted to really double and triple and, and quadruple check uh, his study. Um, uh, a German scientist put some small passerines that migrate from Africa to Europe he put them in a planetarium, like Peoria's uh, beautiful new planetarium, and he would simply move the star's orient orientation on the ceiling, release the birds, they would hit the concrete wall of the planetarium, and he would pick them up off dead off the floor. And then he'd move the stars again, release another bird, and they would hit the wall at a different point. Um, Frank felt that that research was cruel. It was done in the... In the uh, in the 1950s, and but that ornithologist beat Frank to the publication, so they, he gets credit. I don't even remember his name. But I tell you these stories about Frank because he really was a pioneer in migration of birds. Um, how many of you have heard about the uh, Mississippi Flyway or the Atlantic Flyway? Again, if you want to hit um, a thumbs up there, just to let me know that you're familiar with these terms. Uh, most of you are. Um, what you may not know is a gentleman who worked for the Illinois Department of Natural Resources before it was called that, it was the Illinois Natural Resource or Natural History Survey under Frank. He was the first one to map that out. And in his book, Ducks, Geese, and Swans, um, he shows those migratory flyways. And when I interviewed him in Havana, there's now a, uh, a state run um, laboratory. Um, that is called the Frank Belrose Research Center. And you may have been to the Belrose Preserve that uh, uh, joins Emicon. Um, uh, Frank told me he made a mistake. And it wasn't until years later he, he, uh, he realized and would admit his mistake. Um, when he called it the Mississippi Flyway, he was wrong. Because later research proved that 80 to 90% of the waterfowl who migrate along the Mississippi Flyway stop to rest and refuel in the backwater sloughs of the Illinois River. Let that settle in for a while. Instead of the Mississippi Flyway, the guy who created that term thought that maybe we should call it the Illinois Flyway because so many ducks, geese, and swans do migrate along the flyway. I do participate in the Christmas bird count uh, in Peoria and Havana and uh, Chillicothe. Uh, most years I do three to five of them. Recently I've been doing the Quad City counts as well. And I'll never forget the time that uh, uh, Rick and Tracy Fox and I were down near Emaquan, where we were actually across the river near um, uh, Spring Bay. And it was um, you know, a relatively warm day, but it looked like there was a big patch of snow that hadn't melted out in a field. And as we got closer, I realized this was not a bank of snow, that these were geese. No, these were not snow geese. As we got closer, these were trumpeter swans. And so, you know, we all three pull up our binoculars and we're trying to get a head count. And when I got above 100 trumpeter swans, I'm glad that I was wearing a hat because it blew my mind to think that not 50 years ago, there were barely 50 trumpeter swans. And here we were right in the middle of Peoria along the Illinois River, counting well over a hundred trumpeter swans. And thanks to the work of Frank Belrose in first charting those migration routes, but then working to preserve and protect that habitat, uh, the trumpeter swans have made a really wonderful comeback and are beginning to nest in the area. We're seeing them on counts on a pretty regular basis. And this is the work of somebody local. One last uh, Frank Belrose story um, is uh, in the early days of flight, literally the days of Lucky Lindbergh. And maybe you know that uh, Charles Lindbergh crash landed in Peoria, not once, not twice, but three times. Um, uh, in the days of Lucky Lindbergh, when airplanes were still relatively new, um, Frank Belrose taught himself how to fly and began following birds on their migration. And he followed this uh, huge flock of waterfowl heading north along the Illinois River. And the Illinois is kind of the funnel that connects the Great Lakes to the Mississippi Valley. And, uh, and these birds were heading across Lake Michigan. 
Well, he could tell there was a storm coming because weather radar was also new. And one of his friends who had fought in World War II was a radar guy tracking Nazi airplanes as they came into bombing missions. A friend of Frank Belrose was one of the first to use bird migration, to use weather radar to track bird migration. Something we all do all the time now. This was still pioneering days. And so Frank saw this wave of birds heading to Lake Michigan in a tiny little plane. He did not want to fly into a storm over open water. So he quickly got out a chart, figured out the angle of flight, flew around the south end of the lake and picked up those birds at the exact spot where his projected angle would send them, you know, proving that birds do have this incredible sense of navigation and also a pioneer in using weather radar to begin to track bird migrations. So again, another quick show of hands. How many of you have uh, tuned into the uh, bird radar on Facebook or online? If you join a couple of the Illinois uh, Facebook pages, um, they call it birdcast, like uh, forecast, of bird migration. And just recently, um, there's been some really good signs that these weather fluctuations we've had the past couple of days, um, this cold front that just came in, this any day now will be the peak day. So I hope you get out there, go birding along the Illinois River, spend some time in those forested bluffs and those wetlands, and uh, you might be amazed. Or join me, I bird walk in Bishop Hill every week, and we are a little hot spot here. Um, moving forward in history, one of the next stories I want to tell um, is from my favorite, 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 favorite book of all time about birds, and it's called Songbird Migration. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. Not only is it wonderfully informative and inspiring, I would argue it's one of the best pieces of writing in the bird world. It's a very readable book. Um, it's by the research director or communications director at the Cornell Labs, uh, Miyoko Chu. Um, she's got her finger on the pulse at Cornell Labs um, and, uh, and she's a brilliant writer. One of my favorite stories in this book, again, took place right here in Illinois, along the Illinois River Valley. Bill Cochran was an amateur bird watcher, like you and I. He was uh, not a, you know, a fully vetted ornithologist, no degree from a university, but he liked birds. And he had a specialty. His specialty was uh, electronics. He worked in the field of transistor radios. When electronics and radios went from being a piece of furniture to being something you can hold in your hand. And uh, I love my little transistor radio when I was in elementary school. It was actually shaped and painted to look like a Coke can. And that way I could bring it into school and listen to sports or whatever, uh, because I was allowed to have a Coke can. I don't understand that now, but uh, uh, teachers didn't recognize it as a radio at the time. And with a little earbud, I remember when those were new. So Bill Cochran was one of the first to develop a small enough transistor to put on the back of a bird and begin to chart bird migration uh, using tracking devices. He did partner with a friend of his, uh, Richard Graber, who worked for the Illinois Department of Natural Resources and they targeted thrushes. And they caught, I believe the first round, 26 thrushes in Southern Illinois. And um, if the birds were on the ground, then the radar would only work if you were within two or three miles. If the bird was up in the air, he literally drilled a hole in his station wagon. The technology was so primitive. And he put a specially designed antenna through the roof of his station wagon. And he did it that way so that he could manually turn it to get a better direction. And he was able to chart uh, thrush migration across Illinois um, as long as he was within 25 miles of the flying bird. So imagine this man who also was one of the first to figure out that a lot of birds migrate at night. And so late at night, two in the morning, flying down rural dirt roads in Illinois, trying to keep the beeps loud enough on his transistor following thrush migration. Now, you can log on to a variety of websites and in real time, you can follow these transmitters using satellite devices. The technology has improved tremendously. 
Um, but it is kind of fun. Actually, as a gift, somebody bought my wife, knowing that we love sea turtles as kind of a family uh, totem animal. We, we love to go to the beach and we've watched nesting sea turtles in Costa Rica. And so a friend who actually joined us on that, voca on that vacation um, bought my wife a little bracelet made out of plastic taken out of the sea. And with that bracelet that has a little turtle emblem on it, you get a number that you can put into your smartphone or your laptop. And it is the number of an actual sea turtle swimming around the Caribbean. And the last time we checked, it was near the Florida Keys. Um, and so we can use those kind of satellite, that kind of satellite technology to chart bird migrations across the globe. And if you haven't done it yet, I will gently twist your arm, go online, search for some of those sites, uh, bird migration, um, and you can track the birds and see when they're coming to a neighborhood near you. And it's kind of fascinating. Part of that research we've learned, and I think this story might also be in Songbird Journeys, um, that some of the shorebirds will migrate from Scotland over the North Pole, along the Atlantic coast of North America, um, through uh, Cape Cod and the Florida Keys. Then they take the Florida Keys to Panama. They cross the Panamanian Isthmus. It's the most narrow point in the Americas. And then they fly along the west coast of Chile and Argentina to Tierra del Fuego and the Antarctic. Um, using those kind of satellite devices, we now know, uh, I just forgot the name of the bird, a small shore bird the size of a robin. Um, uh, so again, that technology has greatly improved. And taking it half a step further, um, how about tomorrow um, into the future? How many of you eBird? I'm getting a lot of glare there. Let's see if I can do it without so much glare. Oh, it already jumped to the checklist. So if you eBird, then your data that you put in the phone tomorrow is going into these kinds of studies. And you know, more than just a fan of eBird, I'm a huge advocate. Every time I lead a bird hike, which is often these days, I make people get out their phone <laughs> and download eBird. No, I just highly encourage them. And uh, my goal is to sign up a thousand people a year because every time you log into eBird and upload your data, you're contributing valuable information uh, to all kinds of studies. But one of the coolest things that eBird just launched this spring taking your individual sightings and, uh, and Lee's sighting and Gloria's and Bob's and Wendy's and Julie and Jane and Barbie and Mary, all of your individual sightings, Irene and Steve, they put each of those points in and then the map reads those sightings and they just put the bird migration of 800 species of birds using individual sightings in real time. You can watch this little sprinkle of birds migrating north into their nesting habitat and where they linger for a few months in the summer and then slowly making their way south down into Latin America or wherever they spend the winter. And it's intriguing to see the first few little dots moving north and then this wave follows them. One of my favorite personal encounters with that and one of my favorite Audubon portraits is the Blackburnian warbler. Uh, again, thumbs up if you've seen one yet this year. I have not. Um, I'm waiting. Any day now, I expect to see one. Uh, three years ago, I was in Colombia in the autumn, just as the Blackburnian warblers were arriving. And it was amazing to go into the rainforest and see, I think I counted 200 species in, in a couple of weeks. I did hire a guide and went out in different habitats. And if you don't know, Colombia is the birdiest nation in the world. And if you're interested, I've made a really good contact with uh, Birding Colombia. And, um, and Birding Colombia um, leads trips and they've actually uh, invited me. If I can bring 10 or 15 of my friends, uh, we'll all get a discount. And they, they just opened a lodge in the rainforest so they can provide accommodations. And I worked with three different guides from their company on three different days. I just went out for day trips because I was working down there. Um, and when I saw all these tropical birds, I was amazed. But most delightful to me was seeing somebody who looked like a neighbor, seeing the black burning and a war warblers arrive in the fall. And I would like to believe, 
I saw that same black burning and warbler in my backyard in Bishop Hill the following spring. And, uh, and I can use eBird to kind of track those charts when the black burning and warblers are migrating. Um, and our part is citizen science and our, we can do our part through citizen science. Um, now I wanna shift gears and tell a few more personal stories. That story was kind of my transition point. Um, have any of you seen the documentary on HBO called The Central Park Effect? Um, if you have not seen it and if you subscribe to HBO, I highly recommend it. Um, it's relatively short, it's a half hour documentary, um, uh, The Central Park Effect. As I talk to people about it, I am amazed how many people aren't familiar with the concept because I think it's a brilliant concept and all of us could use it as a metaphor. The Central Park Effect is simply this. Imagine you're a Blackburnian warbler and you're flying from South America to the boreal forest. If you're going along the Atlantic flyway, again, thank you, Frank Belrose. If you're going along the Atlantic flyway, there's several hundred miles of Philadelphia, New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, Boston. There's several hundred miles of urban industrial development. And especially near New York City, there are very few green spaces. So when you see Central Park as a little warbler way up above, then it is an oasis. It is an island in the middle of a desert. Um, and so birds fall out. I was birding Central Park um, one day several years ago, and I counted 43 species in about an hour. Um, it, is, it is amazing. It is really thick if you just happen to be on the right day. And I got lucky. I was there working and I was there on the right day. And it happened to be the day that they were filming this documentary. <laughs> and so as an out-of-towner, the documentary's producer interviewed me. And when I told him I portrayed John James Audubon, that must have stuck because about three hours later, I was on another part of the park and he saw me and he says, I've been looking for you. Would you mind if I interview you again as John James Audubon? And maybe you don't know, but Audubon owned uh, 20 acres of Manhattan Island just north of Central Park. Um, so in Audubon's day, you could actually own a farm on Manhattan Island. And so as Audubon, I talked about bird migration in New York. Sadly, I didn't uh, make it into the video. Both of those segments ended up on the cutting room floor. But the concept that these little green oases are the places that we can target because we know that they're out there. And the Central, Ar uh, Central Park effect as a metaphor, what are those oases here in Central Illinois? If I'm a little bird migrating across to Illinois, you know and I know we are the buckle of the Corn Belt. You know and I know that there are millions, literally millions of acres of beans and corn, beans and corn, which this time of year are fallow fields they might have just been planted and plowed, but there's no food for a migrating warbler. So again, uh, into the chat, um, what are your favorite places that you know uh, you're going to see some good birds? Um, what are those Central Park effect places for you? Um, and and uh, you really don't have to go too far from the Peoria area to get to truly internationally significant birding areas. Um, if you don't have one, I did help to write the map. I actually led the team and coordinated the effort. I was the catalyst and instigator uh, to create the Illinois River Road birding map with the help of Peoria Audubon, thank you very much. A couple of your members uh, did spend a lot of time out birding with me. Um, oh, and Barbie, of course, Montrose Harbor um, is, uh, is the magic hedge. I've not been there yet, but Bob Dolgren has promised me a private tour next time I'm up there. And yes, Julie, Spring Lake. Uh, you've got the wetlands, you've got forest, uh, you've got a little bit of open prairie, so you get a good mix of habitat. Um, and actually right in Peoria, the forested bluffs from downtown Peoria out to Camp Wakanda, I call it a string of pearls along the river. Uh, Forest Park, of course, is the one probably more of you go to. Forest Park tends to have as many people as birds on some days. Um, and if you go just north of Forest Park, there's Robinson Woods, there's uh, uh, Singing Woods, and then, of course, Camp uh, Wakanda. And there's actually a trail that you can walk through all of that. And those forested bluffs, 
Yes, there are 48 birding hotspots listed in eBird for Peoria County alone. Thank you, Dennis, for that information. I'll have to look those up. And actually, that's my favorite new toy with uh, eBird. If you go to eBird, and if you got your phone, uh, hit Explore. When you hit the Explore button, you probably can't see that with the glare on the phone. Um, then a mile radius comes up, and you can do 30 mile, 10 mile, 50 mile. I have a 30 mile radius around Bishop Hill. Those are the birding hotspots around Bishop Hill. And so you can find those hotspots easily with eBird. Whenever I'm in a new territory, that's one of the first things I do. And then once you find those hotspots, click on it, explore that spot, you can see what people have been seeing there the past seven days. I'm not a great photographer. I rely on my friends. Thank you, Julie. Um, and I feel like I have a dozen friends who are brilliant photographers. And every time I go to their Facebook page, it's like the field guide of local birds. And you get to see who's in their backyard this week. So I know what to expect in my backyard. And eBird provides those options. So my daughter moved to Kansas City. And I've been birding uh, Shawnee Mission Park, which is a mile and a half from my daughter's house. I actually wrote an article for Bird Watching Magazine uh, last uh, well, I wrote it in the fall. It was published in February about birding during COVID and, uh, and how you can use those birding hotspots near you um, to find places where there aren't a lot of people and there are a lot of birds. And uh, Shawnee Mission Park has more than 200, I think 238 species have been seen there over time. But even better yet, I've made friends on, on the, uh, Facebook by finding them there to go out birding with them when I'm in a new town. And using that technology and their photographs, I know what to look for. And when I was there last spring, um, the flycatchers are coming through. And there's some uh, Western flycatchers who show up in Kansas City. And Kansas City is between Eastern and Western flycatchers. And so looking at their photographs, I could see how much of an eye ring on an alder versus a uh, willow flycatcher. And some of those really subtle differences of hard birds using eBird helped me to connect with what's coming through in the spring migration and uh, made the birding experience uh, more enjoyable. Um, one last story, which is kind of where this program idea began. I am really lucky and I just, I just thank uh, uh, my lucky stars every day with my work uh, that I get to go to so many birding festivals. I usually do at least a dozen birding festivals a year. And uh, luckily for me, the birding festival season keeps expanding. They used to all be crammed into the spring, but now there are some fall migration festivals and there are crane festivals and hummingbird festivals. And if I haven't already told you, um, I'm hosting a hummingbird festival in Bishop Hill, uh, August 14th and 15th. And August is a good time for hummingbird festivals because they haven't left yet but all the young have hatched and fledged. So in mid August is when you're gonna see the most numbers of hummingbirds and the Northern birds are starting to come through. So in mid August is the best time for hummingbirds in central Illinois. So come to our hummingbird festival. But last week I was at a turn festival in Mississippi and my schedule's starting to come back. But I've had the great good fortune to go to the Rookery Bay Festival in Florida and then to do the Alabama Crane Festival the next weekend, because a lot of cranes uh, winter over there. There's a newer festival that's hired me a couple of times called Wings of Winter. I'll be there again in late January. Um, that's at uh, Kentucky Lakes, Tennessee Lakes, uh, Land Between the Lakes, uh, Cumberland Lake is the other one. Uh, uh, Cumberland River and the Tennessee River, Kentucky Lake and Bartlett Lake. Um, it's a really great winter festival because a lot of our waterfowl and eagles winter over there. And so I've been hired to do the string of spring festivals ending with the upper Mississippi River in early June and a Vermont festival. I think actually the Vermont festival is the end of May and then the upper Mississippi in June. And I do feel like um, uh, if I were banding birds, I saw the same birds at seven festivals that they have been hopping from festival to festival, much like I am. And I know that most of us can't afford to do that on our own dime. That's my joy as I get paid to go. But I would highly encourage you. There's a great string of festivals. And if you just did two or three rather than the seven that I get to do, um, you get to see spring migration as it moves north. And there'll be different birds at every stop and there'll be local endemic species. 
and you get to go with some of the best bird guides from that area. And I know that a lot of people with a big year, a lot of people who are listers, um, part of the way you, you, uh, you pad your list is you catch that rare bird out of space where it's not supposed to be. And that's kind of fun for you and I as a bird watcher, but usually that bird is stressed. Usually that bird is lost, been blown off course in a storm. I would rather go see the birds that are supposed to be there in the season they're supposed to be. And that's the thing I like about those birding festivals is the local bird guides, people who have birded those trails year round, who grew up there, maybe got their degree in ornithology from the local university. They are your guides and you get to go see their favorite hot spots in their backyard. And in that regard, I do think it is sometimes worth even hiring a private guide, I am one. Um, but also, you know, when I go to those places like Columbia, it was well worth every nickel, uh, three different days to hire a guide just for the day to get out and see those places. All of this to say that I have had the great good fortune to follow Spring North several years now in the spring festivals. And I hope to do it again next spring. Actually, my biggest disappointment with COVID um, is last year was supposed to be my busiest year ever. I had more than 400 contracted performances just disappear. Like the first two weeks of COVID, I lost 200 gigs. And then within a couple of months, all 400 went away. Um, but the good news is many of them have already said they'll have me back next year. And next fall, I'm supposed to do this same tour backwards. I'm starting in Cincinnati, following the Ohio River to the Mississippi River, following the Mississippi River to New Orleans. And last fall, I booked 60 shows recreating Audubon's journey south, following the fall migration. All of this to say that I've had the great good fortune to not only follow the spring migration, but even more important for me, and hopefully you've learned something by sharing these stories, to ride the coattails of some of the great naturalists to stand on the shoulders of some of the great ornithologists, to know people like Michio uh, Chu Miyokuku, I can never say her name right. I always get the wrong um, K and CH sound. Miyoko Chu, Miyoko Chu, I've got it. Um, to know these people like Frank Belrose and to interview them and to learn from them um, so that my burden experience is richer with this historic perspective in light of modern technology and the evolution of that technology to make us all better birders. So with that story in mind, I would like to open the conversation. Um, and uh, if in chat, um, we know where some of your favorite places are. We know the birds that are your spring harbingers, but I only see one person answered, who are some of your heroes? Who are some of your mentors? Who are some of the local birders, you know, elders in our community um, who have inspired or helped you along? So if you wanna type that into chat, that's the only question that didn't get as many answers. So putting that together, and we do have about 15 minutes left, um, I would like you to uh, um, unmute yourself if you would like, and uh, maybe, a. Uh, uh, turn on your camera and give me a visual hand raise when you have a story. And to give you a minute to think about it, if all of us did a two minute story, we'd be here another half an hour. So not everyone has to take a turn. So really short, just maybe one minute story that answers one of those questions. What is the bird that is the harbinger of spring? What are your favorite birding hot spots? And who is your mentor? And maybe you can weave all three of those to make a better story. If you think about character setting and plot, I ask those questions very pointedly. We've got character setting and plot. Uh, the plot is the discovery of the bird, the harbinger of spring. The characters could be the bird and your hero, your mentor, and then the place. So just to model that, um, really quick story. I think Rick and Tracy Fox are a couple of my heroes. And I'll never forget the first time I did a Christmas bird count with them um, in Chillicothe, just spending the day in the car with them, all the informal chatter along the way, and both their delight with 
you know, adding another bird. So we saw a flock of pigeons on the railroad bridge, the Jillicothe Railroad Bridge, and it was a new bird for the list. So they were ex excited about that as they were as seeing some uh, um, uh, ruby crowned kinglets in the brush along the Illinois River. So just a one or two sentence story. If you wanna uh, turn on your camera and give me a wave, who's got a one or two minute story about your favorite spring migration experience? That's a lot of information to get into a story. And it doesn't need to be a polished uh, novel. It needs to be brief, more like haiku. Who has a story to tell? Well, Go ahead, well, your... Go well, ahead Dennis. While we were waiting for everybody else to, take a, to have a story, I actually had the good fortune of meeting uh, Donald and Lillian Stokes, who are actually put together a bird guide once at the Ding Darling uh, Sanctuary on Sanibel Island in Florida. And what was interesting is that while Lillian was doing all of the filming of a bird for a PBS special that they were going to be doing, Donald Stokes was more interested in knowing, wow, you're from Peoria coming all the way down here to Florida. We really appreciate all this. So he was a very personable person and they were just interested in who is visiting their little neck of the woods. Yeah, I just missed them. I actually was a speaker in that same series the week after they were there. Um, they live on the island, so they're on the, they're part of that series every year. Uh, they have a winter home down there, um, but I just missed them, and that's great. And they are very personable, from what I've heard. Who else has a favorite one minute story about your favorite bird of spring, your favorite place, or one of your birding mentors? Be brave. Hey, this is uh, Julie. And, yes. Um, yeah, I just I just wanted to say that I am like fairly new to birding. I saw that Brian Dorfler is on this this call, and I and I like Brian started out more as a photographer, but now I have become a birder, and the Illinois Birding Network has really opened my eyes to all of the birding throughout Illinois. So I just think that um, a lot of these birders have been my inspiration. And I'm just blown away by all of the migratory birds up in the, up in the Chicago area. So that's, that's been really ex, um, exciting. And I have lots of plans to start following the migration. Yes. And the Magic Hedge is a great place to start. Yes. And I alluded to it earlier before most of you are here, but Julie had a photo on the front page of the Peoria Journal Star. And I love checking out her photos on Facebook. Um, and to be just a little more uh, direct, um, I do really appreciate the work of a fine photographer because uh, I get to see what they're seeing in their backyard and it helps me with bird ID and what's coming through this week. And so take the time to friend uh, some good bird photographers on Facebook and spend a little time with eBird and the Illinois Bird Network and, and Illinois Backyard Birders and Midwest Backyard Birders. I'm probably a member of about 10 of those groups. Uh, because it's very informative and inspiring. So thank you, uh, Brian and Julie, for your photographic efforts. Who else has a story? We'll pause for a moment, let you think of one. What's a magical moment with a spring bird? We all have had one. Something that really caught your ear or eye. What's at your feeder this week? It could have been yesterday or 10 years ago? Well, we have had one person mention that the very famous pair of the piping plovers, uh, Monty and Rose, are once again nesting at Montrose Beach. Yeah, and related to that, since uh, Steve has a photo of the black neck stilt as his, uh, as his ID photo, um, Steve, have you seen the black neck stilts at Emaquan or at Hennepin Hopper? Uh, yeah, that, that's where that picture was taken, was it, at Emaquan? Because the black neck still is actually one of my favorite uh, spring migrants at Emaquan. Um, you know, I, I've, I've been following the progress of that development before the Nature Conservancy bought it. At the time, um, gosh, I just forgot his name. His wife was good friends with my wife and our children played together. He was the, um, the land acquisition director for Nature Conservancy who helped to negotiate the deal for Emaquan. And uh, when they started flooding it, build it and they will come. I was there the first spring that black neck stilts showed up. And it was the first nesting pair in central Illinois. I don't know, like 50 or a hundred years. 
And if you have not seen them, I actually wrote them up when I wrote. So I wrote Emma Kwan as a hotspot near year for Birdwatching Magazine. It was published earlier this spring and uh, or maybe last spring. <laughs> it's been a while. And uh, their dance is like flamenco dancers. It is so cool. You know, you see the photo there, black and white tuxedo with hot pink leggings. The male will come up and stomp his feet real quick, standing next to the female. And if she likes him, then she stomps her feet really quick, like flamenco dancers. And then if they like each other, they're both stamping their feet really fast. They run forward just a few steps, curl out and come back. And I swear, if you were in a uh, had a drone photo, it would be a perfect heart shaped pattern. And then they do it again. One of them stomps, the other one stomps, then they stomp together. And after stomping in place, they run forward just a few steps and do that curl and come back together again. Again, those are the things you only see if you spend a lot of time out in the field. And this is the time to go and see it. One more story. Any more questions? Then let me shift gears, since this is the first time I've done this program, and I, I really feel like I have too many stories, and maybe I need to pare it down just a little. Uh, so if I could ask uh, at least two, what is your favorite story I should definitely include? Which of the stories did you like most? And any suggestions about, I'm trying to get more engagement in Zoom, and so thank you to everyone who raised their hand or who answered my questions. What are the ways I got people engaged that you think I should continue or any suggestions? So really three things, favorite story, favorite technique of engagement and any suggestions, anything you wanna put in the, uh, uh, in the chat would be great. And I thank you in advance. And while you're doing that, I will end with just a brief commercial message. You can go to Amazon, you can buy my new biography or autobiography of Audubon. But if you buy it from me, uh, you get a link to the video and audio file, so you get a multimedia encounter. Um, also, uh, my new book, Bird Tales, it's folk tales and poetry and nonfiction science essays about uh, birds from around the world, with an emphasis on Native American folklore about birds. Um, and again, if you buy it from me, you can get a link um, to the audio and the video. Most of the books uh, that I sell, I put an extra little uh, quarter sheet there that has all the links on it. Um, and it'll be an autographed copy. They're just $10 each, uh, support your local storyteller. And if you would love to, and I know you do, love to come to my Hummingbird Festival, I'm hoping that Peoria Audubon and Quad Cities Audubon will partner with Illinois Audubon to help sponsor the event. Of course, a donation would be great, but even if it's just a donation of a little time, um, what Illinois Audubon and I were talking about is getting the couple local chapters to take turns manning a table at the Hummingbird Festival. Uh, Travis Wilcox is going to come and, and band birds. Uh, we have some music. We have some crafts. Um, I'll do my um, Audubon performance, Audubon's Hummingbirds during the day. I'm writing a new show on Darwin's Hummingbirds using the art and illustration of Gould um, to talk about evolution in hummingbirds in Latin America. Audubon published about 30, well, he didn't publish, but he has about 30 letters and quotes about hummingbirds. So again, he wrote the show, it makes it pretty easy. Um, so if you have any questions in chat, that would be great too. Some of the comments that are now coming in is, one is the intriguing thing about my birding hobby is that I tend to do very little actual birding activity in my home state of Illinois. But instead, I use birding as a catalyst for extended travel to other states birding hotspots. Brian, that's a great comment. But uh, the thing that I found during COVID, and this was a theme of my article for Birdwatching Magazine, um, is uh, that, you know, I, I couldn't go to Colombia or Korea, which I've done in the past two years. Um, and I had a trip planned uh, um, to Peru. So it really helped me to focus more on local birding. And there are lots of birding hotspots near you. So that's kind of nice. And Julie, you said you had a short story that you might be able to share? Oh, no, I, well, you asked the question about um, the type of formats. Oh, okay. Yep. And I was just saying that, you Asking know, more questions some, chat. some, some birders are kind of shy mm -hmm. when it comes to talking. Yeah. But I like to be able to, to share stories. Oh, and, and while I was having a senior moment, I couldn't unmute myself, but, um, you know, I love watching um, the behavior of the birds 
I have a Junko that chose to stay. And I wondered if that's like unusual behavior. He does have a little bit of a wing issue, but he didn't migrate with the rest of them. Ah, well, I'd be uh, interested in a long-term report on that. So uh, let keep us posted. Yeah, I'll be I'll be watching him. Yeah. Oh, I love Lee's question. What phonology records are available, and how has it changed with current climate change issues? Lee, that's a brilliant question, and and I will say. Um, Again, I'm so lucky. I was at the uh, Nebraska Crane Festival, I think three years ago, um, when Audubon uh, launched and announced publicly um, their long-term study of climate change and bird habitats. And so the National Audubon Society science director was the other keynote speaker. He and I shared the podium. Um, I'm the entertaining one, he's the scientist. Um, and he, uh, he was talking about how um, citizen science, like eBird, um, has given us, just in the past 10 years, how some bird populations have clearly shifted. You know, if you're a high elevation bird, like a lazuli bunting, um, that lives at a certain elevation and climate change has pushed that habitat, sometimes it pushes it off the top of the mountain. And so the habitat for the lazuli bunting is disappearing in some of the lower mountains and that means it's being diminished, so it's only exists on the taller mountains, but they're being pushed off the mountains as if the island was underwater. And eventually, like the Hawaiian Islands are the tallest mountains in the world, my friends from Hawaii tell me, um, but most of them are underwater. So imagine if the ocean just kept rising, all the birds in Hawaii would be drowned. Well, that is happening now in the Rockies. And we know this in large part because of citizen science projects like eBird, but also uh, phonology. I'm a huge fan of phonology. You know, Thomas Jefferson kept detailed records on his first mosquito bite, for his first bird, average daily temperatures. I also portray Gregor Mendel and Gregor Mendel in uh, uh, Moravia, now part of the Czech Republic. Um, he kept the same kind of detailed records on birds and insects and flowers blooming. Every day took the temperature at dawn and noon and dusk. And so thanks to some of these historical characters that I portray, uh, we have these detailed phonology records. And so back to Audubon, one really obvious one. In Audubon's day, the fish crow was exclusively a coastal bird. And I was in Mississippi uh, three days ago and I saw lots and lots of fish crow. Um, in recent years, fish crow are showing up in Illinois. And I saw a fish crow in Southern Illinois. And when I put it in eBird, eBird called me out. And I got a private email saying, no, nah, you're wrong. <laughs> there are no fish crow in Southern Illinois. And now it's becoming common to see fish crow in Southern Illinois. I mean, what further proof do you need that the climate is changing and that Southern birds are now able to uh, adapt to uh, the changing climate by moving north, which raises a different kinds of question. This was the focus of the Audubon Society is if we're buying this seaside habitat to protect a uh, seaside sparrow, for example, and 10 years from now that habitat is underwater, then we've wasted a lot of money buying expensive seaside habitat. So maybe we should look at be buy buying something higher up in the dunes. So when the ocean level rises, we have habitat for seaside sparrows. And so there's a lot of complicated questions based on, um, and at that point we had just dropped out of the um, Paris Accord, now we're back in. So do we make the right choices and diminish that or to continue to make bad choices and it's worse than projected? Uh, that's, that's the tricky thing. So uh, phonology and following Springs North, our theme, uh, do go hand in hand and birds are the canary in the coal mine in so many ways about uh, climate change. Um, thank you, Lee, for that question. And thank you for the feedback, for those who already typed something in um, about what worked in this program, because I'm sure I'm gonna do it again. Hopefully next time live and in person and not via Zoom. But I, I like playing with Zoom and, and uh, hopefully you felt like this is more than just a TV show. It was a conversation. Well, on behalf of Peoria Audubon Society, we really appreciate your taking the time to come and speak with us this evening. And I'm sure we'll have a long relationship continuing on and go from there. So if there are any other last 
minute questions. Uh, everyone is free to ask. And let me know if you want to go birding Bishop Hill. There you go, folks. Can't pass up an offer like that. Where is Bishop Hill? Uh, some people are not familiar with it. So depending on where you're coming from, it's about an hour. I, you know, I work for the Spirit of Peoria still, so I commute uh, about 20 times a summer. And it is 54 minutes from my front door to the Spirit of Peoria. So if you're in Morton or East Peoria, it's a little more than an hour. If you're in Dunlap or West, uh, Northwest side of Peoria, it's a little less than an hour. Well, have a good night. Thanks again. I'll see all right, you all soon.